Okay, hello, and welcome to uh, the fourth session today of the very first VegFest UK Trade and Media Online show. Uh, today, August 14th, Friday, at just around about 4.30 BST. Um, very warm welcome to anyone just joining us live now to, to come in and join the panel as we live stream. Um, and of course, this will be available as a recording later, as from tomorrow. You'll be able to watch the panel um, as a recording um, from the from the same area here that you're accessing um, this this webinar. You can come in. Uh, there's uh, there's a number of other presentations, um, and of course, we've had some fantastic live streams earlier in the day. Today is number four, and we're looking at. Uh, health and nutrition are specifically around the recent you know COVID-19 crisis how that's affected people and specifically the health um, we've been very very fortunate uh, for our first show to be um, supported by a number of people including our sponsors I should say at this point Butte Island Cheese and Yayo Hemp Products um, if you're just tuning in please do remember to go and have a look at our exhibitors after the uh, the webinar they're available in the exhibitors hall there's some fantastic exhibitors and along with our sponsors we are very grateful for the um support and the trust and the faith and the backing they've shown in this initiative um indeed likewise the the amount of support we've had from some very distinguished speakers We've had some quality speakers, uh, not only for today at the trade day, but also for the coming weekend at Summerfest. We are blessed with some very generous, considerate, experienced, articulate, and just all around wonderful people contributing to the show uh, as a real community effort to try and help those, uh, especially in the trade, who are challenged specifically by the recent uh, crisis and I would imagine that is pretty much everyone uh, in different ways um, so um, do use these resources do share them with your friends they're available for 30 days afterwards um, they're free they come with with our best wishes um, we'll be doing more we've got another one in November London online 13th of November and then again in March next year in March 19th, 2021 for Plant Powered Expo Online. These are gonna be trade days, trade and media, specifically focusing on vegan, plant-based and independent. Um, so do support us as we go forward. If you'd like to support our work, we do have the Friends of Veg Fest, Veg Fest initiative, Friends of Veg Fest UK initiative, which is um, the opportunity to uh, help with the funding of these um, online shows, of which of course there's a lot of work. Um, so thank you all of our participants. Thank you for those watching. And a particular thanks to um, my host here, Gareth Seal, who is a long-term friend and vegan. Uh, we go back a long, long way, back to the days when Gareth was breaking the ground in vegan sports nutrition, as indeed he still is. And I'm, I'm very grateful for Gareth for coming on board to give up his valuable time to uh, share some of his really deep and um, up to speed knowledge of uh, all things related to health and nutrition right now. And Gareth, I know you will do us the honours too of introducing your guest panellists. So without further to do, I shall hand over to Gareth Seal for this webinar on health and nutrition. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you, Tim. I'm delighted in introducing Ella Allred, who's a very extensively experienced nutritionist. She specializes in autoimmune disorders, does a lot of work with industry and in education in general. She has an extensive practice, and I know she gets phenomenal results. She's also incredibly thorough about going through the research. I wanted today to be more conversational, so we'll be bouncing bits off each other. A um, few areas of, how should we say, conflict in terms of people's understanding of the research. And I thought we'd open today with B12, an essential nutrient for all the population and one that vegans focus on particularly. And the particular issue I want to look at today is the benefits 
or not of uh, cyanocobalamin compared to methylcobalamin. So Ella, it's over to you to kick us off. Okay, fabulous. Thanks for that introduction, Gareth. That was excellent. Um, as Gareth said, you know, I do work extensively in industry um, in the pharmaceutical food supplement market. And I have quite an extensive knowledge of the food supplements that are on the market, actually. And the majority of you listening to this will be either taking a B12 supplement or, or you know, um, trying to get it from your functional foods such as yeast flakes. Um, but let's talk about supplements because ideally if you are um, following a vegan diet then it is good to have a b12 at least in a multi-nutrient formula now there's lots of b12s on the market they come in different forms so they come in the form of cyanocobalamin they come in the form of methylcobalamin now when you take cyanocobalamin um, your body converts that into two forms so it converts it into methylcobalamin and it also converts it into adenosylcobalamin. Now, these are long words, so just bear with me. Um, so these two forms are actually really necessary for the body to function, to do, you know, make um, energy, um, brain function, many, many um, functions in the body. And so we do need both of those forms. We do need cyan um, sorry, methylcobalamin and adenosylcobalamin. So when you take that cyanocobalamin, essentially you are converting into those two forms. Now, there is on the market another type of B12 called methylcobalamin as a supplement um, on its own. And basically, if you take methylcobalamin on its own, what you're not getting is that conversion into adenosylcobalamin because it does not convert back into cyanocobalamin and then into adenosylcobalamin. So essentially, unless you've got a problem with converting cyanocobalamin into methylcobalamin, unless you've got that specific problem, you should always take cyanocobalamin first. You could take methylcobalamin alongside it or adenosine cobalamin, but you should, unless you've got that specific problem, then there's no reason to take that methylated form. Now, if you do have an issue with that conversion process, then you can take methylcobalamin, but you also need to find a supplement that contains adenosine cobalamin as well. So you have those two active forms in the body. Have I made that clear, Gareth? I think lucid, thank you so much. One of my memories from college, um, one of the doctors there, it's in the days of the early days of the methylated bees, and it was pyridoxal 5-phosphate as opposed to regular pyridoxine. And he made the point for his practice, 90% of the women he was giving it to for PMS responded beautifully to regular pyridoxine, so good old B6. But there was about 10% uh, where the pyridoxal form was better. So he would give them B6, and if he didn't get fantastic results after a few months, then he'd try the other version. But he said, for most people, you're just wasting your money. And the other book I send people to, one, it's a wonderful resource, is Vegan for Life. Uh, the two scientists who wrote it are very thorough again, reference everything, and they make the point that uh, cyanocobalamin is where most of the research has been done and it's stable. Methylcobalamin may theoretically be better absorbed, but it's terribly unstable and you might need to take a factor of five or 10 times as much to achieve the same result. Now that's their speculation, not mine. And I think you made the point about the two forms needed. So unless you know you have an issue with the methylation, I'd stick to good old B12. And that's been my take on it. And I think it's similar to your approach. Absolutely. And, you know, while we're on the subject of vitamin B12, I'd also like to pop in there um, pseudo vitamin B12. So I don't know if any of you have heard of that. The pseudo vitamin B12 is, um, is a vitamin B12 like substance and it's found in some seaweeds and it competes in the body for absorption with real vitamin B12. So again, when you're looking at kind of functional foods and supplementation, um, I mean, more with functional foods, it's important to make sure that you're not consuming too much pseudo vitamin B12 and that you are actually taking enough supplemental vitamin B12 to make sure that your body does have the right levels. Yeah, on that point, um, I tend to trot out, it's a study from the late 70s, if I'm not, might have been early 80s. And it's a macrobiotic community in Holland. Um, and when they did B12 tests, um, all the children were deficient 
and half the adults, and they were relying on seaweed for their B12. Again, years ago, I made myself very unpopular at one presentation by suggesting spirulina and corella were not functional forms of B12. They're an analog. It doesn't actually make it into the cell, and as you say, potentially could block it. Absolutely. And just on your point of spirulina there, Gareth, and these kind of functional superfoods like so for example spirulina you know it's packed full of nutrients i'm absolutely not denying that but when you look at the nutrition chart they quote the amount of nutrition per 100 grams but nobody eats 100 grams of spirulina because that's disgusting like even a teaspoon is like pretty grim so what you have to look is actually what quantity is you know is the, the article or whatever the website referring to for the, the quantity of spirulina that I need to get this nutrition. So I agree with the, yeah. the brain, we can't just rely on that for our, for our nutritional needs. No, it's impractical. It's one of the first questions when people ask me, should they buy Corella, spirulina, all these other things? I asked, do you like the brassicas? Do you like cabbage, broccoli, Brussels, watercress? And if their answer is yes, then said, you probably don't need it. Because uh, all those foods are super nutrient dense, taste great unlike spirulina, although I must add now, I've discovered organic blue spirulina, which has no Ooh. taste. And we actually use it in our cafe, in smoothies and in other foods, because it doesn't taste as spirulina, but it does give it. And you're right, you're giving those figures, because um, you'll eat a plate of broccoli, but you're not going to eat two dessert spoons of spirulina, it's unlikely. Um, and yes, you do need to master taste. I tend to say apple juice or blueberry juice if you're adding it to smoothies, because you've got to do something to master the taste. Absolutely, it's pretty grim. Yeah, it is nutrient dense. Chlorella may be having some other functions. And it's not to say, as you say, they are incredibly nutrient dense. Again, but there are straightforward ways of getting it through food. You don't have to use spirulina. And actually, now, if you are, you know, a healthy vegan i'm referring to people that aren't junk food vegans you know vegans that eat a lot of um you know junk food and, and modified or processed foods so we're talking about you know if you are healthy you eat whole foods grains sprouted um foods and these kind of um you know nutrient rich foods then actually you should be getting a wide range of nutrients and flavonoids and all of these nutrients from uh, from your diet anyway certainly i think that's a really good point to make I mean, I've stolen it from Tony. He's not the first to use it. Tony is a, a chef and used to do the publicity for the Vegan Society, but he's constantly trying to educate children into the benefits of like, diversely coloured. So we eat a rainbow a day, which I think is a nice, neat way to, and you can look at the different foods. As you say, you get the bioflavonoids, you get your carotenoids, um, the water soluble and fat soluble pigments, depending. And they look good and taste good. It's my brief to my chefs is they put a rainbow on every plate and they've done a pretty good job of that. A uh, little green um but yeah because it is easy if you're just eating junk food you need burgers sausages bread maybe a bit of rice and pasta and not really get much nutrient density but if you're eating a genuinely plant-based diet with lots of fruits nuts seeds then the density is excellent and hopefully really? tasting really good and also as well you know um plant-based diets are higher in a certain level of nutrients um versus you know people that eat meat or animal products typically when they analyze the diets um although things like b12 we need we need to put in some more consideration but actually generally a plant-based diet they typically are higher in vitamin c and folate and things like magnesium carotenoids flavonoids fiber so you know if, if you are eating proper food then you are actually you're winning um against the rest of the population in some aspects and i would guess i mean if you practice anything like mine you see an awful lot of people with digestive disorders. Um, and one of the many benefits of multiple vegetables, I, mean, I know they can cause a bit of wind, artichokes are famous for it, um, is you improve gut flora significantly by diversifying your diet. Absolutely. And can I just add that, mm. oh, Gareth, sorry to interrupt you there, but mm. when you're improving the gut flora, actually the probiotics in your gut, they produce vitamins and minerals themselves so they produce some things like b vitamins and a research has shown that they are actually producing vitamin c only about two milligrams per day not really enough to get you by but they are producing things like vitamin k and b vitamins which again then increases your nutrient um you know the, the nutrient level in your body and helps to provide the, those valuable nutrients that we need 
Oh, thank you for that, because on the vitamin K subject, I know there have been a couple of studies recently showing that broad spectrum probiotics have improved bone density. And there's slight obsession at the moment. If you're taking vitamin D, it's compulsory to take it alongside vitamin K. My suggestion is to take a probiotic with the vitamin D and then you get the gut to make your own vitamin K. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you on that, Gareth. Um, I mean, if you have a, you know, a well-functioning gut, if you're eating enough fiber, which you know, if you're on a plant-based diet, most likely you, you will be getting enough fiber. Um, if you really you know, have a healthy gut, sort your gut, gut out, take the probiotics. And also if you're eating green leafy vegetables, which contain vitamin K anyway, so you know, that's kind of the best way to go around it. Take a vitamin D supplement, you know, get your levels checked by your doctor if you, if you need to, or by a, you know, a nutritionist and go from there really. I would just add here that Ella and I have worked together for a couple of years, but haven't really had a chance to have a discussion on things. So this is educational for me and it's, it's a chance to um, find the areas where we agree and disagree. But back to the, on the gut, um, I find that a lot of people are horrified when I tell them they should be having a bowel movement after each meal. Do you find a similar distress with Oh people? my goodness, oh my goodness. So many people are like, what, I have one every five days. And I'm like horrified, absolutely horrified. Honestly, one in, one out, one meal in, one meal out, that's how it should be. Indeed. I do know uh, uh, she's head of um, oh, herbal medicine at one of the colleges. And one of the things she gives all her patients, I think she goes, says, go down to the pound shop and she buys them a little stool. So when they're on the toilet, it raises their knees because naturally humans would have sat that way. And that Absolutely. enhances and protects the abdominal wall at the same time. So we can help them from the dietary side, but that little mechanical change can make a huge difference. Absolutely. And also I recommend to my clients who are constipated to actually squat on the, on the toilet, <laughs> you know, take your shoes off and put your feet on the toilet seat and squat down because it actually really straightens out the colon. So if you are struggling to have a bowel movement, then that is a, you know, a way of helping it along a little bit. Absolutely. And it goes back, you know, to the traditional Indian culture and medicine. They all have, well, they're having modern toilets now, like Western toilets, but now, you know, they used to have the squatting ones on the ground and it's so much better for your, for your bowel movements and your, and your colon. It is ludicrous that the UK is one of the leading consumers of laxatives and with the worst constipation. Um, a bit more exercise and a bit more vegetables and the population would be a lot better off. Absolutely. And don't forget, let's go back to those probiotics, Gareth. You know, for a lot of constipated and functionally constipated people, actually, they, all they need is, is probiotics because those pro probiotics will produce those short chain, chain fatty acids which are going to nourish the gut wall and then help that peristaltic action. So that's the movement of the, the gut, you know, pushing the, the food and the, the poo along. So a lot of the time, actually, it's a microflora issue as well as a fiber issue. And interestingly, it sounds a bit gross, but it's also very interesting. Most of the weight of your poo is actually bacteria yeah. rather yeah. than fiber. And I love that fact, absolutely. So although we need fiber because that feeds the bacteria, if you're constipated, it's likely you didn't have enough fiber or enough bacteria because those bacteria aren't making up that weight of the, the fecal matter. It's true. I mean, we are covered in bacteria inside and out, and most of it should be beneficial, but if you feed it the wrong things, we often end up with problems. Um, back to the foods like leeks, garlic, onions, which provide an environment for the bacteria to thrive. And I think Tim would like us to focus a little bit, and I think you've really alluded to it, once you have that healthy bacterial community, what's your immune system going to do? Is it going to attack you or look after you? I think everybody can pretty much guess what that answer is there, Gareth. But I know it's one of your specialist areas, autoimmune Absolutely. disorder, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'll just kind of give an ex a little explanation as to how that works. Um, so under the... Um, intestines we have a patch of tissue called the gut associated lymphoid tissue and in here um, is a store of um, T, T immune cells, T cells, okay, T helper cells and they are the ones that help to regulate the immune system so whether it's going to attack your own body tissues or whether it's going to attack the virus the pathogen and that gut associated lymphoid tissue has direct communication with the the, set, the intestines and the probiotics 
or the you know the back, negative bacteria or the parasites in your gut so when you've got those probiotics and you've got the healthy gut flora, we, what we find is a lot of inflammation's decreased. People are having better immune responses versus somebody that may have like, maybe they've got a lot of issues. They might have parasites. They might have yeasts who tend to be over inflammatory because the, the yeasts and the, um, the negative bacteria then trigger that inflammation via the gut associated lymphoid tissue and causes all that inflammation in the body. Um, and we're more likely to catch illnesses and diseases in that state. So that's kind of my simple explanation of how the probiotics, you know, really help to improve the immune system. And also let's move on to vitamin D, Gareth, because it seems to flow a little bit. So vitamin D is actually stored in the gut associated lymphoid tissue and low levels of vitamin D are, um, are linked to um, high incidences of autoimmune disorders, but also high incidences of infections. Um, there's a recent study came out that showed that actually um, you're more likely to catch COVID-19 if you've got lower levels of vitamin D, um, lower than 50 nmol per liter of blood. So if you go to your doctor, you get a test, you'll get a number. Ideally, it should be around 100, but if, if it's under 50, then it, you, know, you need to do something pretty quick, really. Um, so yeah, so kind of the, the probiotics and the vitamin D work together to help regulate that immune response and help you to, to fight things like COVID-19 or, or you know, viruses or bacteria that's in, out there in the environment. Yeah, I know COVID is the one everybody's focusing on with good reason at the moment. And I believe there's lower risk of death if your vitamin D levels are adequate. And as you said, you're less likely to acquire it. Working backwards, a number of London hospitals have been using vitamin D for tuberculosis alongside, it has to be said, strong antibiotics, but they get a much better response. People coming from sub-Saharan Africa have often had tuberculosis in their system for years. And it's only when they move to an area with the world with inadequate sunshine that it develops and comes out. So sunshine is good for us for all kinds, and not least of which is the vitamin D, raising our mood. And that raising our mood probably has a separate but independent positive effect on our immune function. And uh, a trial on women who were trying to get pregnant to prevent rickets in their children, they provided them with 4,000 units a day every day for three years. And the unexpected side effect of this for the mums was they lowered the risk of colds and flu by as much as 60 to 70 percent so that's a cheap intervention through the winter um, on a vegan diet it is tough to get vitamin d but then we're not designed to get it from food we're designed to get it from sunlight so long as you're not covered in sun cream um, and if you are fair skinned of irish or scottish descent and you burn really easily then five minutes just five minutes will give you a decent amount of vitamin d then put big hat on clothing or sunscreen and that will protect you and they've shown that if you sit in the shade of a tree, but there's a pool or patio for sunlight to bounce off, you don't need to be in direct sunshine and you still get your vitamin D, which is the key nutrient we're chasing here. I have noticed now that supermarkets are offering vitamin D enriched mushrooms. If you have the luxury of a garden or a window box, grow your mushrooms in sunshine and they convert sunlight, not dissimilarly to humans, into vitamin D. So if you can get them growing for yourself, that's one way of getting it from a food source. You can get it from lichen and other bits and pieces. The other ones more commonly, obviously, is fish oil, but that won't work for vegans. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, like, you know, like you said, vitamin D is really important and an essential nutrient, but none of my clients have ever, you know, had adequate levels. I test nearly all of my clients because it is such an important um, factor for the immune system and they're all pretty much, you know, inadequate, deficient. Once I had somebody that was like very deficient, like five and the ideally level should be near a hundred. So, you know, it's like, how are you still walking around? Um, and actually I'm finding that the reason is because people are inside too much and you know, they're not exposing their skin to adequate levels of, of sunlight every day like they should be, like our ancestors would have been, you know, in the tribes or like living outside. And the darker the skin tone, the harder it is to make vitamin D in this in English climate, okay? So when you go to hot countries, typically the skin tone gets darker and that's to protect 
um, than from burning. But in in this climate, it can be very challenging to make that enough enough vitamin D. So I would say, like, absolutely get a test and a vitamin D supplement for nearly everybody. You know, I, I recommend. I know we're in the peak of summer now, uh, but I remember some Australian research showing that four thousands of units of vitamin D, that's international units, I know most of all say in micrograms, uh, was effective for half the people suffering with seasonally affected disorder. So if you do find your mood dipping during the winter and that will compromise your immune system, up your vitamin D. So it's not only going to look after your colds and flu, but it'll help your mood too. And as you also, rightly say, <laughs> go on. Yeah. So also, some people have, you know, an issue with storing vitamin D as well. So there's genetic defects that you can have, which means you cannot store it. You can't, you know, utilize it effectively. And I unfortunately am one of those people. So every day I have to make sure that I'm out in the sun for about an hour or I'm taking my vitamin D supplement because I cannot store it. So if I check my levels one day, you know, they'll probably be different the next. Well, that's worth knowing. I mean, you're fortunate to discover that because I remember one doctor who specialized in bone health and vitamin D. He was a British doctor, moved to Canada in the winter. His child developed wobbly bone syndrome and it took him a few months to work out it was lack of vitamin D. And that was his specialism. Um, he gave the child the vitamin D and it was fine. Um, but he, he felt awful because um, uh, he really should have picked it out seeing as that was his expertise. So vitamin D, incredibly crucial. Um, do you have concerns about people taking high levels? Um, no, because I generally test first. Um, you know, if people can't afford it, then I send them to their doctor and the doctor will do it for free. Um, you know, if people can afford it, it costs like 25 pounds. So I generally get all of my, my clients tested. Um, what I would say though, if you were concerned you know, you didn't know what your levels were, if you're concerned about taking too much because you can take too much, then I would say take no more than one to 2,000 international units per day. But if you yeah. have, you know, the if you are yeah. able to get a test, then that would be great because if you are deficient, then you would need significant levels to, ra to, raise, to raise your blood levels quickly. Um, yeah. If you are, sorry, that's my dog barking in the background. <laughs> if you are, um, if you do have a lot of vitamin D, if you are one of those lucky few that do have enough, then two high doses of supplementation can be toxic. Yes, they can. And that is why I always recommend testing for my clients. On that one, because I do plot this out, there's a vitamin D forum in America run by a group of medics who, as far as I know, have no commercial axe to grind. They're not working for vitamin D companies in any shape or form. But uh, the only time I saw the one doctor get really upset, one of the women writing in was saying, since I've been taking vitamin E, and we have to bear in mind, she was 32, 34 stones. So she was morbidly obese. Um, she no longer had any knee pain. And instead of getting ill every three weeks, um, she got to no longer any infections. But um, the amount she was taking was truly ludicrous. It was 350,000 units a day and she had managed to kill herself, probably due to her obesity, because it's much harder to absorb the vitamin D. But you could almost hear the doctor on the other end, please stop now before you kill yourself. Um, but I don't think most people can go anywhere near those sort of levels. No, absolutely. And even for my clients that are very deficient, you know, I give them maybe 20,000 international units per week. So one tablet per week um, and then retest after six weeks. It's an easy amount. And most people remember to take things once a week, not all of them, but most can. And while we're on sort of inexpensive nutrients and there's a decent work too, selenium, selenium, depending which side of the water you're on, uh, a wonderful trace mineral shown to, again, lower the risk of COVID deaths, potentially antiviral. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, it, well, we definitely know that it's an essential nutrient. Um, now, the issue is it tends to be deficient in European soils. And selenium is a great, it's very powerful antioxidant and it's needed for the production of glutathione, which is kind of your body's major antioxidant um, in the body. Um, and, it, you know, there's been loads of clinical research and um, studies and trials and looking at things like selenium and different forms of cancers, um, mainly, func and, the, you know, the function of the immune system and its general role as an antioxidant. Now, 
it is deficient in European soils. And unfortunately, you know, I'm a massive fan of organic food. I just, you know, I don't understand why people would want to eat pesticides. Unfortunately, selenium does tend to be even more deficient in organic vegetables, organic foods. So, you know, if we are eating European, you know, organic foods, fruits and vegetables, and, you know, this kind of thing, then selenium is absolutely something that I would look into in a, in a supplement. This is slightly tangential, but I've seen we've got a number of questions. So I'm going to answer. The question is, and it does kind of relate, um, is it necessary to eat kimchi, sauerkraut to increase probiotics, or is eating a cabbage salad sufficient? Um, I think, again, we probably agree on this one. You don't need to have the fermented foods. They are wonderful. Uh, but leeks on a plate will work just as nicely. Um, cabbage can be harsh on the, some people's digestions. Again, how do you feel we should deal with that one? Yeah, um, fermented foods are okay for some people. Um, they can cause problems in other people though. And the, you know, fermented foods, if they're particularly if they're home fermented or, or it's not done in a controlled environment, you don't actually know what bacteria you're getting. So probably the majority of it will be, will be beneficial, but we don't actually know. And the whole point of, you know, taking these fiber rich foods is to increase the probiotics in your gut. So you don't necessarily need to eat those fermented foods to, it's to colonize the gut. Essentially, you have those probiotics in your gut already. And taking things like fiber or even a probiotic supplement, which, you know, is like lactobacillus, whatever, that's controlled um, bacteria that activates the biofilms and the probiotics in your own gut to proliferate and and to breed and you know do all the wonderful things in your gut so fermented foods it's it's not really essential um some people if they're immunocompromised for example can even cause problems thank you for that one. another earlier question which uh, I've, that's why i put my glasses on to see them uh, was talking about we were on the subject of methylation and converting b vitamins in from one form to another um, they're asking, how do you know you're not making the conversion? My simplistic one is take the regular one or the sign of cobalamin B12 or regular B6 first. See if you feel the benefits or more importantly, uh, um, if after a few months you're not feeling significant benefits, then it might be worth a blood test. Again, how do you think on that one? Yeah, absolutely. I would always start with cyanocobalamin and see how you feel. You know, signs of vitamin b12 deficiency things like fatigue or low immunity and you know if fatigue is one of your symptoms then you should start seeing improvements taking a b12 you know pretty soon within a couple of days you know i would say even within a week um because you have that those nutrients to make that energy um and again with your immune system if it's low and you keep getting you know colds then you, you should see pretty soon maybe within a month an improvement in that and if you don't see an improvement, then it may be worth trying a mixture of um, methylcobalamin and adenosylcobalamin. Thank you can you. also get genetic tests, um, but you know they can be quite pricey. So I always go along the lines of let's try cyanocobalamin first and see how you get on. That's pretty much my approach. So yeah, if they can afford the tests, all well and good, then you can send bloods off and find out. Um, and the other question now is, Vitamin D, when should we start taking it? September, October, because somebody said that obviously winter sunshine doesn't provide adequate vitamin D. There isn't as much sunshine. My rule of thumb is October through March. Um, everyone should probably be taking it. And I do, again, it's an American trial where an elderly population were given half a million units of vitamin D at the beginning of winter. Then they had their blood levels measured every month. And they were good until the end of January. And then they needed a top up which was a surprise. Um, they obviously the majority were able to store it to a point. Um, but yeah, that's a big hit in one go. And I should add that nobody had any ill effects. That's quite interesting, actually, Gareth. I would say it actually depends on your, your exposure to, to the sunlight. Mm -hmm. And how much time do you spend outside? Are you able to get out in the evenings, and you know, afternoons, evenings, weekends, to get some sun exposure? You know, if you're if you need to cover up for maybe religious or cultural reasons, then absolutely you need to take a vitamin D in the summer as well. Um, but generally it depends on the weather. So I would say, you know, October to March, if it's still snowing in April, carry on until April, until you can basically achieve a decent amount of 
time outside. Um, as I said, you know, I specialize in autoimmunity. So a lot of my clients um, do have majorly compromised immune systems. And for those clients, every day, even in the summer, they have vitamin D. I have to say, I mean, and as you say, the levels you're suggesting a modest amount every day, it's not going to do anyone any harm anyway, um, and potentially give them huge benefit. Absolutely. Now, going back to selenium, because it's an interesting trace mineral, and its lack is definitely problematic. Um, you've alluded to how much of an anti-inflammatory it potentially can be, and so many disease disorders start with inflammation. When I was in college, uh, college it's a while ago now anyway, one of the tutors there quoted a Chinese study and he did say at the beginning, he said, please don't use this in your practice, but um, they were looking at an Ebola type virus. Um, and somebody decided to give the patients a heroic, and I do mean heroic amount of selenium. In this case, three to four milligrams. So that's three to 4,000 micrograms, those not familiar, which is potentially fatal. Um, However, they did get a 40% survival rate in the people taking the selenium. So not something to do on the shop floor, in your practice or in your home, but uh, uh, it is an illustration of how powerful uh, an antiviral selenium can be. My borderline is about 600 micrograms. I quite often use it for people with the herpes family because it is a nice little antiviral that doesn't cost a lot for people on a budget. Uh, I don't know which, where you use it. Um, but yes, I, I think it should be part of any antiviral protocol. And particularly at the moment, we know it's deficient in our soil. Um, so let's try um, a handful of Brazil nuts potentially could provide you with enough. Um, I think the number's actually only three or four. And I normally get asked at this point, are chocolate co coated Brazil nuts adequate? And I'm afraid I have to say, yes, they're okay. Because <laughs> uh, if that's the only way you're gonna get them in, yeah. So I, that's interesting, you know, obviously Brazil nuts are uh, famous for being high in selenium. Um, I have read some research though, however, that states that their levels aren't as high as they used to be. And maybe that's due to intensive farming, you know, lack of nutrition in the soil, whatever. So I wouldn't necessarily just rely on Brazil nuts. I would, you know, make an effort to eat Brazil nuts every day, but also make sure that selenium was included in my multi or take a set left separate selenium if you're if you want something specific the selenium is very good for male fertility very good for the prostate gland very good for sperm motility so if you have a very specific issue like that that you know you need selenium or even like certain types of cancers or you have high inflammation then i would take selenium as a separate supplement otherwise just make sure you're having in a multi and um, you are you know having your brazil nuts every day as well So just a little distracted, I was looking at some more of the questions. Um, yes, now I, I think we should all try and add nuts to the diet and a supplemental level of selenium because it's not wildly practical in the UK to get enough from diet. It really is not. Um, and the benefits again are huge. Uh, the one time you definitely don't want to be taking too much is pregnancy. Um, it then because it can have disadvantages takes for the fetus that's for sure and it's why it was banned in australia for a while in case people overdosed but generally speaking 100 to 200 micrograms is going to benefit most people lower your risk of infections potentially help you fight infections and as you've just said lower the risk of several major cancers but bear with me while i just check this one question um is eating yogurt stroke lassi with live bacteria sufficient to act as a probiotic how do you feel about that one Okay, so um, probiotics, you know, um, they do obviously, you know, milk obviously contains probiotics. And when you eat, uh, sorry, not milk, yogurt, so like whether that's um, soy yogurt or whatever, that, you know, they obviously provide those probiotics. And if you're, if you're eating that, my concern is the exposure of the bacteria to the stomach acid. Now, the research does show that actually quite a lot of those bacteria will be destroyed by the stomach acid. So some will survive, but the most of them will not. When you take a probiotic in supplemental form, then the capsule shell generally helps. Um, sometimes the capsules bypass the stomach acid, go straight into the intestines and release their contents there. Um, also in a capsule, you know um, the strength, so it tends to be much higher levels than a, than a yogurt, a probiotic yogurt. 
Um, if you were you to try and consume the same level in, in your soy yogurt, you'd probably be eating about six pots per day or six large pots or something. Um, so taking a, a supplement, I really value that actually as, as something that's important in my clinic, as well as eating that, that yogurt and, and those, um, you know, fermented products. Um, yeah, I would say combine the two, have a, a probiotic supplement and, and a yogurt. Thank you. That, that's it. Um, there's another selenium question. Um, and this time they're asking, I don't live in the UK. Uh, how do I know if there's adequate selenium in the soil or potentially too much? Because I know there are certain parts of Africa. If you have too many Brazil nuts, you end up with selenium toxicity, which tends to be overly curled toenails and a distinct yellowing. Um, but I think you should have figures for every country. You know, the, the Ministry of Agriculture, whatever it is, should be able to tell you what the soil levels are like, at least within a ballpark, because you know, even the UK has quite a variation in levels. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the, the levels exactly for all the continents, but I know that the whole of Europe is particularly deficient. So anything outside of that, I don't know. You, you have to look at your, at your local, um, you know, in your areas, so look at the statistics and the levels. I thought you might like this one. Uh, the person was wondering if SIBO and CIFO are more common in plant-based diets. Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, if SIBO and CIFO, yeah, inflammatory okay. bowel. Yeah, yeah, Smaller yeah. testosterone bacterial overgrowth, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not something that I particularly notice more common in my clinic. I would say majority of people that come in my clinic do have digestive and gut issues and quite a large portion of those, you know, it is down to SIBO. Um, but generally, you know, with SIBO, if you correct the stomach acid, it's generally stomach acid imbalance. You correct that stomach acid and the SIBO sorts itself out. Um, I, you know, majority of my clients have digestive issues and I wouldn't say it's particular on a plant-based diet or like, or particular to anybody that, you know, eats a standard Western diet. Yeah, no, I don't think on that one, because colleagues used to tease me, my first answer to everything was betaine hydrochloride, which is the stomach acid. Um, again, fall to one of the doctors in college who felt it underlied most conditions, you know, it's certainly a huge number. Um, we don't eat enough bitter foods, but we eat too much dairy, cola, coffee, get stressed, chew gum, drink concentrated fruit juice, all of which, and smoke, uh, all of which wreck our levels. So by the time we try and digest food, we really are struggling. Uh, cut all of those out it's much easier for the stomach to produce adequate levels of acid and that's a point i think ellen and i are probably constantly telling customers your digestive issues your reflux your heartburn is not too much stomach acid it's too little it's just acid in the wrong place absolutely yes that is you know one of my big bugbearers everybody's on acid suppressors or you know meprosol and <sighs> It's, they're taking them like candy really but actually you know you've got to have that right acidity level if you want to correct your SIBO and I wouldn't say it was um, more to do with whether somebody was eating plant-based diet or whether they're having a standard diet that includes meat um, it's more to do with you know like you can have a you can be eating a junk food even if you're vegan or, or you can have you know a junk food if you eat meat it's more to do with those um, excess sugars and and things in the diet for that um so you know obviously when if you do have SIBO the first one of the first things you'd want to do along with um correcting the stomach acid is remove the FODMAP foods now that is like putting a little bit of a plaster on a wound because it doesn't essentially get rid of the <laughs> SIBO itself you need to correct the um the stomach acid at the same time but when you, you might find that after you've corrected that stomach acid, when you put those FODMAP foods back in, then you would see, a, you know, a significant improvement. Thank you, Ella. I think we both had it now. You've had your dog. I was waiting for one of the cats to run across the screen. And of course, my phone went off. Um, but while we're on the subject of antivirals, we've talked about selenium, potentially vitamin D, probiotics actually helping us make our own antiviral compounds within the gut. Vitamin C, a personal favourite if you can take enough of it. Um, and on the subject of COVID, there is a Canadian trial current, because it's not been published yet, where they are injecting people with vitamin C if they're going in with COVID to see what response they get. I love vitamin C as an antiviral. The problem is sometimes we can't take enough of it. Uh, I don't know how much you use, but uh, again, I, 
benefits or otherwise one tutor in college is very good doctor who took between 10 and 20 grams a day that was his, right. his yeah yeah i mean that is very high 10 and 20 grams and there are you know from what i've been reading there are some issues with taking that much you not only may you get diarrhea but it also increases the absorption of aluminium at their extremely high levels so i um from a vitamin C perspective, I think, you know, we should all be taking it absolutely. Um, you know, plant-based diets generally have a higher level of vitamin C anyway than standard um, Western diets. But still, you know, in this climate with COVID and all these horrible things going around, I would absolutely still take a supplemental. And I would say two to three grams, so that's two to three thousand milligrams per day as standard. Um, you know, if you do go mega high, then you do have to be careful because it does increase the absorption of aluminium. So anything, any slight amount of aluminium that's in your medications or in your diet or whatever is going to enhance that. So you need to be careful of that. Um, you know, but two to three grams to, you know, which is 2000 to 3000 milligrams, you know, that's a good amount for people to take. I'd agree. And one to three grams is manageable for most people. The other levels are slightly on the insane side. Uh, but that was what was working for him and he found it. Because I, I, with your point with aluminium, most of us have got rid of our aluminium saucepans and things on the same reason and wouldn't cook rhubarb in it for love nor money. Um, but yes, and then people get concerned about aluminium in antiperspirants and deodorants. And so we're trying to avoid it, not increase our levels within the body. So I think that's a very pertinent point. Absolutely. And also, you know, be careful because they do put it in medications as well. So even if you think, you know, you're using a good aluminium free deodorant, aluminium free baking powder, bicarbonate of soda actually often comes with aluminium. Worryingly, it's in food additives, a lot of artificial um, flavors and colors, you know, and thickeners. You'd actually be horrified if you knew what went into some some products. Um, and they, they're not necessarily labelled neither, they would just be under a certain colour or a certain flavour that contains aluminium. So unless you're eating, you know, you're cooking from scratch everything, it, it is difficult to avoid sometimes. And on that, um, infant digestions aren't fully developed until they're about 12, 14 months old and have an inability to eliminate aluminium, so it's much more toxic for them. So that's why I tend to advocate you don't give a child under 12 months soya because a lot of the soya formulas and things are very high aluminium and cabbage too, potentially. Um, once they get older than that, they, they get much better at efficient at eliminating it. So it's not so much of a concern, the relatively small amount that's in there, but younger than that, it can be problematic. Now, this is moving on to one of my favorite antiviral com compounds, uh, beta-glucans, um, available from everyone's favorite mushrooms um, and certain forms of yeast. I strongly believe they are an answer to an awful lot of illnesses because the great thing with them, they're safe with autoimmune disorders, they're antiviral, antibacterial, if that's what you need them to be because they'll only strengthen the immune system when it needs strengthening. Um, it gets a little confusing, people say, well, how much do I have to take? My rule of thumb is two to three milligrams per kilo weight for prevention, four to six milligrams per kilo of weight for an infection. And if you're unfortunate enough to have to undergo chemo or radiotherapy, then you go as high as 10 to 12 milligrams per kilo of weight with suitable medical guidance. Um, again, any thoughts on those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love beta-glucans actually, and I love the way that they do modulate the immune system rather than making it overactive. Um, so it's gonna help you only if you need help, right? And you know, I'm quite interested in the research that looks at the prevention of cancer with beta-glucans and also, the be, you know, giving beta-glucans to people that have cancer already. I mean, I don't know how much we're allowed to talk about cancer on these webinars, but there's some really interesting research on there, particularly on colon cancer and beta-glucans, actually. They do give them quite a high dose, um, which you wouldn't necessarily want to take unless you were, you know, you had that cancer or some horrible um, disease. But I think absolutely, you know, when COVID-19 is going around and not just that, it's just all the colds and the flus and things um, going into the autumn, that beta-glucans, if you can get it in a, in a daily supplement, you'll be well away. Well, that's it. They lower the risk of colds, flu, hay fever and other infections in general. Um, 
And if you're an athlete training hard, this is one of the areas I use it because you're constantly compromising your immune system. They help the immune system bounce back that minimizing sugar. But we do have another question here. We may go back to beta glucans. Uh, the question is how supplement change, sorry, excuse me, how supplementation should change in the over 50s vegan diet, if any changes at all. Um, I'll start with this one and I'll pass it to you. Um, a lot of people, when they get into 50, start worrying about the bone health, and particularly on a vegan diet, because you get told you're not going to get enough calcium. Um, you may not get enough vitamin K, you're not getting your iodine because you don't drink milk. So do we, should we have to worry? Well, the main thing is the level of exercise you've done between 15 and 25. And if you've done a lot of exercise, then you set your bone density up nicely. It's a bit of a cliche, but I do say, pick your parents carefully. And if they're both six foot rugby players, it's very unlikely you're gonna end up with osteoporosis. If they're both six, five foot smokers, I'm afraid your odds are pushed completely over the direction. Do you smoke a lot? That's the best way to thin your bones. Do you drink a lot of coffee? It's not awful, but it's not great. Are you very fond of salt? Do you like too much alcohol? All of these things will leach the calcium. So those are things, if that's what you're worried about, is your shrinking bone density. I personally have everyone over 40, pretty much, certainly over 50, taking coenzyme Q10. And that's not so much a dietary change, it's just we don't synthesize it the way we used to. So adding that in additionally benefits most people. Potentially the B vitamins, the B6, folate, and uh, B12 can lower the risk of dementia. That's something you might want to look at. Um, I'm generally aiming for about 100 micrograms of B12, 400 micrograms of folic acid if you're female, maybe 600 if you're male, and as little as 10 to 50 milligrams of B6 combined, they are great for lowering the risk of dementia. So good multivitamin or B complex, that's certainly something I'd be looking at. You might want to add in one of the other mushrooms, lion's mane, that seems to be fairly beneficial. And keeping your gut in good shape seems to keep your brain and mood in again. And the B12, significantly lower in older people, does affect depression significantly and potentially immune function. So those are ones for various reasons, well, actually three or four different reasons, it's worth looking at. Do you have any thoughts on what the over 50s should be taking? Yeah, absolutely. I would just say, make sure that you have an adequate level of omega-3. I mean, I absolutely agree with everything you've said, Gareth, particularly with the... Um, you know, the bone health and coenzyme Q10. But my addition to that would be omega-3. So whether that comes from flaxseed or chia seed oil or, you know, algae oil, which contains the active form of um, DHA, that would be a good source. And as you get older, it is important to look up your brain. And the majority of your brain is, um, well, not the majority, but a high level of your brain is fat, omega-3 fat. So you need to maintain that level on a daily basis. And, you know, everyone says, oh, how are you going to get omega-3 if you're not eating fish? But actually, you know, as long as you're taking flax oil and you're taking, um, you know, or chia oil or algae oil is, is fine. And actually, the research is showing that if you, um, if you previously ate meat and then you became a vegetarian or became a vegan, it would take two years for your body to be able to effectively utilize the omega-3 from plant sources. So you may be deficient for two years, but after two years of being vegetarian or vegan, your body then works, uses that pathway more effectively. So you'd be better able to convert the, um, the alpha linoleic acid into, um, into you know, functional omega-3 EPA and DHA. Um, if you are in that transition period, so if you have, you know, being a vegan or vegetarian for less than two years, I would say just try and support that pathway as much as you can by putting in quite high levels of omega-3, flaxseed oil, you know, chia seed oil, walnuts. Um, and if you can, get an algae oil because that has functional um, DHA in it. I must say I'm very fond of the algae oils. And with any fatty acid, you need B3, B6, zinc and magnesium for adequate absorption. So it's yet another argument for a decent multi. Um, obviously, the foods often rich in oil often come with free zinc and magnesium like nuts and seeds, uh, but sometimes supplementing because one of the things we do is way over consume vegetable oils. Don't need to tell you. And that depletes those nutrients. So by the time you get round to your omega-3 rich source of food, you run out of the nutrients to absorb it. Um, so you may well need to cutting back on vegetable oils is definitely worthwhile for most people, regardless whether they're vegan, carnivorous, omnivorous, or whatever they like to call themselves. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And also don't forget that the body uses omega-6 and omega-3 in balance. And you have to have that in balance, you know, twice as much omega-6 to omega-3. But actually, when you look at diets nowadays, it can be 15 times the amount of omega-6 to omega-3. So that ratio is way out of whack. And it can be hard to get omega-3, but if you really focus on getting those, um, you know, those seeds and those oils in every day, then it is definitely going to help. And also, Gareth, going back to um, what you were saying about the coenzyme Q10, again, you know, this is another one of my favorite nutrients because when, you know, like you said, when you get past the age of 30, you stop your production of coenzyme Q10 to close down. So by the time you get to 50, 60, 70, actually, you're probably producing a quarter of, or a half of what you need. And coenzyme Q10, again, is essential for the brain and for heart health. And these are typical things that start going a bit, you know, wonky when we get, get a bit older. And also anybody that's on statins, it's essential that you take coenzyme Q10 because the pathway that the medicine stops you producing um, cholesterol in your body also stops you producing coenzyme Q10. So that supplemental form is essential. Yes, I mean, and we... Um talked about vitamin D in terms of its protection and everything else, but it also keeps our bone density better. It doesn't actually make the bone thicker, but it makes it less brittle, which is, means you're less likely to have a fracture and fall. Because oddly, it's not the fall that necessarily causes a fracture. Sometimes it is a fracture causing a fall. Um, so a bit extra vitamin D, not, it also stops you wobbling, which can be a factor. But most importantly, if you are concerned about your bone health, it's the cheap, easy way. And we talked about this earlier, vitamin D plus a probiotic should really look after your bone density. Now, Absolutely. focusing on this one specifically now, because somebody, and this is where we're getting on thin ice ethically, it says, if one has been prescribed ADCAL, can they take, su oh, supplement, oh, I see, yes. Uh, I don't read the question, but can they take the supplements mentioned alongside? Yes, you can. So can please repeat the name of the supplement. Okay. Right, alongside your ADCAL, you can take magnesium, zinc, vitamin D, uh, probiotics, um, eating leafy greens, or potentially a natto as a condiment for the vitamin K. Uh, but yeah, there's no problem because the problem with most of the prescriptions for bone health, they totally focus on calcium, forgetting all the other cofactors. And generally speaking, the UK diet is okay for calcium, whether you're vegan or vegetarian or meat eating. It's just we get rid of it too quickly. But what it is low is in magnesium and zinc and other nutrients which are absolutely essential for your bone health, but everyone spent decades focusing on calcium and nothing else. Absolutely. And I'm just going to go over that point again, Gareth, because, mm. you know, they say like, well, vegans, where are you going to get your calcium from? You don't drink milk. But actually, if you look at the level of um, calcium and tofu, it's pretty high. And that is, you know, probably one of the reasons is because they add it as a firming agent. Um, but if you are eating things like tofu and these kind of products, you will be getting some, you know, a good level of calcium in there. But also, you know, when we're looking at bone health, it's not just about calcium because calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, you know, these are like the bricks of the, of the bone wall. But you need the cement to keep the, keep the bone wall together, so to speak. So the cement is made of things like zinc, boron, selenium, um, vitamin C, all other, you know, essential nutrients that you can get from a, a good plant-based diet that's going to help to strengthen those bones. So if you think what is stronger, if you take a sledgehammer to a small wall with lots of cement or a big wall with no cement, what's going to break, what's going to fall? It's going to be the big wall with no cement. So as important as calcium, magnesium, phosphorus is, it's also important to get that cement in place with you think your, you know, zinc, um, boron, selenium, um, vitamin C. That's great, because that answers that one really nicely, but also making very clear the picture of how a diversity of nutrients is so important and is achievable through diet in part. Um, but yes, don't focus on a single nutrient because you lose the plot a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully that's answered the question for the individual. Um, but yes, take your ADCAL if that's what's prescribed, but do take a lot of other nutrients alongside to get far greater benefit. And walk a day every day and not only does it get you out in sunshine because back to your earlier point that we don't get out enough um children used to walk to school i know it's a cliche now but they get driven now so they don't see it even on the school run um so if you're walking to and from school that's probably long enough and it's not too long to risk burning but it's long enough to get a decent amount of vitamin d but if you're stuck in a car you're not going to see any 
And I know you mentioned traditional dress. Historically, we got enough vitamin D through our eyes, and then they invented sunglasses. Uh, so we stop it there. Yes, the sunglasses protect us against macular degeneration, but they do stop the vitamin D absorption. All right, any other nutrients you want to go over? Because otherwise, I think we've covered things fairly well, and hopefully, we got yeah. all the questions answered. I think we've pretty much um, covered things quite well, unless anybody else has got any questions. So it's been really fun chatting to you, because uh, a couple of years I've waited for this, uh, a chance to talk to you and, and bounce ideas off each other, different clinical experience. Tim's sitting there now, so we'll hand over to you, Tim. Gareth Eller, that's fascinating. I have actually been sitting listening. Um, <clears throat> I've forgotten the word but already, but I've never heard such passion for, for beta, beta cat carcins. Beta glucans, beta glucans. Beta gluten, there you go, I've learned something today. Eat your um, mushrooms, use... brown field mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms, they're the ones, yeah. There you go. What, what I really do actually like is the way that you can translate a lot of this nutritional information, which is quite complex and is obviously based on a lot of research. It's a very intelligent um, people, you know, a lot of science and, and, um, and learning goes into it. But what I love about it is you can translate a lot of that information into very easily absorbable um, language that's very valuable, but it's basically sort of street language. So people can, you know, especially I think valuable for shopkeepers and independent retailers can kind of get this knowledge and pass it on quite quickly in a shop format, which is a real skill and talent. And it's a backbone of the natural health um, independent retailers really is that that's that free knowledge that's available for um, customers in many respects has, has replaced some of the GP um, function that you refer to when kids used to walk to school and such like and back in the day when GPs had time to talk to their patients and know them and you know sort of family doctors and such like um, and I do see that the, the, the knowledge that you're able to, uh, you know, kind of translate for the rest of us, really. And I, I was just fascinated. And Ella, likewise, it was just great to hear such eloquence. And, but, you, you know, the passion that you actually enjoy all this is it, fun and that you know what you're on about. You know how to deliver it. And I think certainly um, I've learned a few things um, about absorption, about um, the the conversion of oils that's really interesting, the omega-3s. Um, so thank you both for sharing your depths. Indeed, pretty big depths, profound depths of knowledge and experience with us there. Um, I hope our participants found that interesting. It will be available afterwards, uh, tomorrow. You know, all these are recorded and people can come back for another 30 days actually and come and watch these um, broadcast live streams and presentations. So if you found this useful, if you're listening, you know, you're welcome to invite your friends and colleagues uh, to come and visit the show. Um, we will be back again in November, hopefully doing another trade day. And again, then next March. So there's, there's more opportunities for people to get involved. Um, we've had a fantastic day actually, Gareth, Ella. We've been on air since 11 o'clock this morning. We've had four fantastic sessions, um, yourselves included, and we've had some real luminaries from the natural health profession, vegan, plant-based suppliers, independent retailers, um, and experts. Um, so uh, a heartfelt thanks and gratitude to both of you for joining us, and especially to you, Gareth, for putting this together and for battling through the technology <laughs> to be able to join us. It just goes to show that if you persevere, we get there. Um, and thank you, too, for the people who have asked some questions. There were some really interesting questions which prompted some, some very informative answers, actually. So, um, again, thank you. Thank you to our hosts. Thank you to my colleague Pete and Chris, who've been working away in the background. And thank you to our VFAIRS hosts, who have um, really done us a, a very good job, actually. And I hope, I hope that people who have visited today will, will see the value in what we're doing and will support it. It's, it's very difficult to get people out of bed, even for a free event where you just have to go online. But, you know, I hope people will see the value in what we're doing. I hope people will support it and that we will grow 
and uh, this will continue. Um, it's a great start and I'll just say again, thank you both of you. And uh, we shall wrap up there and leave it there for the day. Thanks very much, Gareth. Thanks, Ella. Goodbye. Thank you. I know. Thanks, Tim.